a little bit more now because we're joined by Carl Rove. Um, Carl Rove, Republican strategist, former senior advisor to President George W. Bush, who's been through an inaugural and a second inaugural. Carl, thanks for taking some time for us. You bet. Thanks for having me. Uh, so, quick reactions from you to this speech. You've, you've been involved in a second inaugural uh, commencement address. How did this one stack up to your expectations? Yeah. Well, you know, I, like you, I was surprised by the programmatic nature of it. I mean, it began with some lofty notes talking about the Declaration of Independence and our responsibility to uh, constantly search to make its, its words uh, reality. But then it quickly got down into a programmatic activity. Uh, and I was surprised by three things. First, I was surprised by the priorities. Uh, the president said, for example, at the close, the priorities of our generation are, and he gave them in this order, equal pay, gay marriage, voting protections, immigration reform, gun control. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not certain those are necessarily the highest priorities facing America today. Uh, I, I also was surprised by what he said was not going to be a priority. He went out of his way to say Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security don't sap the strength of the country. They don't make us a nation of takers. They instead, you know, make us, they free us, they liberate us. Well, these entitlement programs are uh, the most serious fiscal problem facing the country over the medium and long term. We've made a series of promises we can't keep. Medicare, the average American will put in just over $100,000 in taxes over the course of their working career and take out over $330,000 in benefits. But he was very clearly saying, we're not gonna be dealing with this at all. And the final thing that surprised me was what he did not allude to. He'd spent very little time, no mention at all of deficits and spending, very little time on terrorism, and no big focus on the number one issue that most Americans are concerned about today, which is jobs and the economy. We have unacceptably high unemployment and anemically low growth, and uh, that's what most people are concerned about, and we heard very little about it except one glancing reference to reforming worker training and revamping the tax code. So, Carl, here's an excerpt from the speech. Let's listen together. Let us each of us now embrace with solemn duty and awesome joy what is our lasting birthright. With common effort and common purpose, with passion and dedication, let us answer the call of history and carry into an uncertain future that precious light of freedom. Okay, President Obama just moments ago. Um, Carl Rove, um, is, is he going to answer the call of history? Are, are we going to be able to do that behind him? He, he made some comments about we cannot mistake absolutism for principle um, or substitute the spectacle of politics or treat name-calling as reasoned debate. That doesn't seem kind of conciliatory or like a uh, collective way forward. Well, normally that would be considered conciliatory, except we've all been witnessing his recent name-calling and his recent bitterness. I mean, you know, the, here's the president yesterday morning, his friends and allies and uh, aides tell the New York Times, among other things, that now he feels liberated to be more, quote, bloodier minded about Republicans. I mean, uh, those kind of notes would be conciliatory if, if delivered by somebody other than President Obama. But, but no, look, I, I thought towards the end where he said, you know, look, our oath of office uh, does not pledge to, does not uh, you know pledge us to act on behalf of party or faction was the right note to stri strike however it's been a, it, it's at total odds with what he's been doing uh, since the election particularly what he's been doing since Christmas time so uh, you know we'll see uh, this is a moment that we come together as a country to celebrate either the peaceful transfer of power or the reaffirmation of our leadership but uh, there's no guarantee that what the president says on this day is what the president does tomorrow, and we'll, we'll see if the, what this president does. Well, I guess, Carl, that raises a broader question, which is whether inaugural addresses really can ever set the tone. Um, are they here today and gone tomorrow, or can they actually affect the way things happen in Washington? Oh, they, they, they can set the tone, uh, whether or not they are fulfilled. If you look at Bush's address in 2005, for example, he talked about the democracy agenda, which he did pursue for the balance of his time in office. Uh, sometimes with a great success, the surge in Iraq, sometimes with lesser success, sometimes with success that is affirmed by his, by his successor, uh, PEPFAR and uh, AIDS and malaria efforts in Africa, for example. But also he spent time talking about <laughs> Social Security reform, which he talked about during the campaign in which he made the key element of his 2005 legislative agenda, which, as you know, went nowhere. Went nowhere with Democrats, even though the Reform Commission had been led by a prominent Democrat, Daniel Poitier, Patrick Moynihan, and no, went nowhere with his own party. That sometimes that's what happens in a second term. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much, uh, Carl Rove, Republican strategist. We appreciate your time today.